Hey, I'm Todd Brown, and I make these videos because I want you to rip on race day. Todd Brown with Pedal Industries, and joining me today is the amazing Jennifer Woolman. And um, so tell us about yourself, Jennifer. Like, um, give us like a quick, well, let me just say one thing. I discovered you on social media because you were doing these really cool mindset videos. And I don't even know yeah. how you came into my feed. So I guess tell us a little bit about Algorithm. yourself and then let's talk about those videos for sure because they're super cool. Thank you. Yeah. So I, um, I'm, I'm Jennifer and I do, uh, I'm an age, a competitive age group triathlete is kind of how I started getting into the sport. And so I do that. And I also run a cycling company in Costa Rica, which is five days of really, um, challenging riding. We'll say, um, a pretty steep, amazing grades up volcanoes in the jungle. So I run that as well. Um, and that's my sport life. And then that kind of led me to doing more mindset work because as you know, in sports, so much is in your head. And so I discovered a lot of things about out of about myself through sport. And I was like, oh, this is actually applicable to so many other areas of my life. Um, yeah. So the mindset I do is I work with athletes either on their races or their mentality. And also just like, how do you apply that to your relationships and business and parenting and whatever else the rest of your life? Because it's all applicable. Yeah, that's cool. So let's just backtrack just a little bit. Okay. You said competitive age group athlete. So let's yeah. talk about that. Like. The, like what level are we talking about? Like I know, but they don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I go to I go to lots of world championships. <laughs> yeah, so that's competitive, right? <laughs> that's competitive. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I'm gonna go. I'm actually I'm training right now for Norseman, which is the world championship in extreme triathlon. So that's in August. Is that the one where you jump off a boat yeah, and that's swim it. to shore, like in the Baltic Sea or like yeah. Norway? That's where is it? it? Norwegian Sea. I, it's in a, I, you, you know what? I should know. It's in a lake. It's, it's up in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> if you jump into something, it's quite cold. And then you, uh, you ride your bike. It's, um, like 11,000 feet of climbing within 112 ish miles. And then the marathon has like 4,000 feet of climbing. You like climb to the top of the ski slope. Yeah. Wow. So will you take a road so, bike on that or will you take your TT? I'm going to take my TT bike. So I'm going to switch out my, my gearing a bit to have better climbing gears. Um, yeah. But I, I'm real comfortable riding my TT bike. And so much of the climbs are not super steep and then a lot of really good, like clear descents, not a lot of windy descents. And I think I would lose a lot of time if I wasn't on my TT bike. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Just my metric I, is a hundred feet per mile is a legit climbing day. Yeah. And so you're right <laughs> on that. Like if it's 80, I'm like, yeah, it was pretty good. But if it's 120, like, okay, that's, that's a legit that's climbing right. day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. Okay. And how cold will the water be when you, when you jump in? That's a great question. Anywhere from like 50 to 55 degrees, okay, which so is cold. Terrible, but yeah, cold cold it's pretty, it's pretty it's cold morning, to swim. Some weird cold cold water thing coming in but yeah it, it, and it's a full ironman distance swim so that's a long that's a good oh. amount of time to be in cold water so for those that don't know how far is that 2.4 miles yeah that's legit that's legit and oh well how long will that take you the swim a normal ironman takes like an, an hour and, and eight minutes hour and five minutes now this i think will take me longer because it's okay. it's so cold or i'll be really fast i'll be so cold <laughs> Right. Will you have a? Will you get a thicker wetsuit on your torso, or will you just use I, your normal wetsuit? I'm gonna wear my normal wetsuit, and I'm gonna wear like the cap with like the ear coverings, and you're allowed to wear booties. So I have them. I'm gonna test them out and see how I like them. Yeah, that's yeah. A to sit. That's a big decision. My feet. I've swam in like 57, 56, and like you, my hands get cold, but everything else is all right, and I yeah. can't wear gloves anyhow. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Right on. Okay. So I'm yeah. super excited about that. And so you, yeah, you're a legit competitive age grouper. Some people don't recognize or understand. I think that triathlon competitive age group, that level for many of you, you could race in the pro ranks and put up decent times and yeah. people that transition out of pro and go right into age group like that. That's yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. Yeah. It's really, I mean, the, and my age group is highly competitive. And so, yeah, the women I'm racing against are, could easily be pros easily. Yeah. They're really, really talented. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did you get into triathlon? Uh, through CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Obviously. A lot. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So it makes now, sense because it's a lot it of is. activities. But other than that, how do you go from CrossFit to to Ironman? Yeah, I was. So I was lifting. I, I never did any sports as a kid, like nothing. Um, and I'm not. I'm not super like. I can't like do anything with like ball sports are not my thing. I don't know what to do with them. Um, and I'm not like particularly fast. So I never did any sports as a kid. And but I started doing CrossFit. And it was the first time I was like called an athlete and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So I did like scale competitions and like, I worked really hard and I finally like learned to do a muscle up, like all those, you know, things. Oh, wow. And uh, my weightlifting coach's wife is Marilyn Shakota, who was a pro triathlete, who's been a pro cyclist. She's coached lots of, she's a really well-known coach in the space. And she would watch me lift and she would hear the story that I would go from my house. I'd run two miles. I would do a CrossFit class. I would then lift like you know power lifting and then run home <laughs> that was like my normal day and so she was like huh <laughs> that you know that's a terrible way to be a crossfitter but for me it was just like how I'm built is to like right. do lots of stuff and so she was like you know have you thought about doing triathlon I think actually like you might be a triathlete <laughs> oh just straight to triathlon not like why don't you go do a 5k no straight because I've done like running stuff and I would I would use this spin bike and when I got pregnant I started swimming again I've never like been taught how to swim but in college I would swim three miles every Saturday like okay. straight I would just like I know <laughs> yeah. are you on the swim team no never I just like swimming and I would like write the papers in my head and so I would just like I would just swim and so I told her this and she's, and I had started, picked up swimming again when I got pregnant. And I was like, yeah, I just swim for an hour. She's like, well, like, how do you break it up? I was like, oh, I don't break it up. I get in the pool and then I swim straight for an hour and then I get out of the pool. Like, what? Wow. You were knocking out three miles in an hour? <laughs> no, no, this was, no, I was knocking oh. out. Uh, I was probably doing like a 2K in an hour at that time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's I've never been cool. that fast. Yeah. So she suggested trying. So knowing all those things about me and seeing how I'm like physically built, I'm not yeah. built to lift weights. I'm built to do endurance. Yeah. Sure. Um, she, she, and I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I did my first one and I loved it. And then I was and, in. Uh, what distance did you do for the first one? A sprint. Swim was in the pool. Did like that weird pool sprint. I've never done that before. It's, it's, I've done worse, that than, it's worse than open water swim. Actually. Ours, the one I did finished in the pool. So it wasn't. Oh too crazy you know you, uh -huh. you swam a length and then went on that uh, was something like that but did yours finish in the pool or start in the pool start in the pool was it just chaos it was just chaos it was i think that's the most contact i've ever had in the swim still people <laughs> were like flip turning and like stopping and you do two loops of it it was yeah it was chaos so i did that okay. and this yeah then i did the, the bike and the run and i loved it uh okay so i gotta ask what was the first bike you had for that event for that so initially i had this like really old hybrid bike and i was like oh i'm just gonna use this and i like took it out and like we lost the canal it's the canal and i went like 10 miles and i was like this is not gonna no if i'm gonna do this i'm gonna at least have like a proper bike and so i had like specialized at one point made this bike where it was like half road bike half tt bike with this like weird geometry where we could like add tt bars on it and it was kind of set up for it Okay. It actually was like a really bad road bike and a really bad TT bike. <laughs> <Right. I mean. laughs> but I don't know. That seemed reasonable. So I got that and I did that. I did that and all the way up to my first 70.3 on that bike. Okay. And it wasn't until like a year and a half in that I actually got like a TT bike. Was that a game changer for you? It was. It helps to have a TT bike. <laughs> it's a, it's useful. And now I have like a proper road bike and a gravel bike and a TT bike. You know, once you get one bike, you just get all the other ones too. <laughs> Yeah. Got to build out that quiver for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, that is okay. So then you did a full Ironman. I did a full Ironman a year, two years into. I waited, I did a full year of racing 70.3s before I did a full Ironman what was, on purpose. What was like the biggest change from 70.3 to full? I mean, by the way, 70.3 is a half. So what was the yeah. biggest change from a half to a full? Like what was the biggest uh, challenge that you had to overcome? I mean, just the the volume of training is significantly higher. Not the whole time, but like that last eight weeks before an Ironman versus a 70.3 is like night and day difference and how exhausted you are. Like you just are so tired because you're just training so much. Yeah. Um, and you're out there by yourself or I'm out there by myself for a long time. So it's a lot of 100 mile rides. 
20 mile run. Like it's just, you're like, man, I am just training a lot. And 17.3 is it's much shorter. It's faster, right? It's more intense, but it's shorter. And so like the, the volume is a really big difference between the two of them. And some people excel and some people just can't do it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, some people just have their sweet spot. So, well, I want to ask you a question then. When do you start your taper for an Ironman? Like how far out? Not very far. Um, I will taper maybe a week out from an Ironman. It kind of That's depends it? on what my, yeah, it kind of depends on what my build looks like. We've done, I've tried this around and I do better. I don't do well with tapers. Like I do better with like a drop taper. Uh -huh. Um, I do better if I like keep everything moving a lot up until uh -huh. it. Um, yeah, it's okay. It depends. Like Kona, I did a little bit more because it was so hot in Phoenix that I needed a little more time to recover from the heat. Mm. Um, but if it's like start of the season, like when I did Texas, I, I had more of like a drop taper than I had a traditional one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, what is it? Okay. So what's the taper week look like for you for, for a high level age grouper? What's the taper week look like? Is it half um, medium, quarter volume? It is, I mean, I will still let's, so let's say two weeks out will still be maybe, so typically like I'll, I'll do about 20 hours of training about eight weeks out from an Ironman. That'll be my like consistent training will be that every throughout week. the year, every week throughout the year, I'll hold like 14 hours, even off season, about like 14 hours of training. That's just like base level training. Yeah, and then when it gets higher, you know, 17, 18, but then it's a good solid, like, like last week I did 27 hours of training, which is a different Norse Norseman's a whole different ball game, but, yeah. um, you know, and so I'll back it down to that, like 15 level where you, your volume decreases, but your intensity still stays high. So I'll still do some higher intensity work within that. And the week of the Ironman is more, uh, like I'll do like an hour and 20 ride with some like really, really fast sprint stuff, like really fast. And I'm not to get you tired, but just enough to get the legs like powerful. Yeah. Um, and then maybe like a 45 minute run where 30 minutes, that's like a race effort. Um, you know, a, a swim also swim pretty hard up until I travel. Some of it depends on when I travel too. Sure. Um, and then the three days before is like recovery spin, super easy run, get in the lake or wherever you're going to swim. And those are really easy, but no, like no rest days during a taper for me. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, that, that's interesting. It's just, it's, it's such a balance, right? So all three yeah. activities and everything there. So, um, you talked a little bit about intensity and, uh, you and I chatted about this when we met, um, yeah. a while back, which is group rides, mm -hmm. um, on the bike. And so talk about how, what, what, what's your opinion on group rides for, for triathletes and, and specifically, you know, yeah. Um, what yeah i know you have some thoughts on that i do because i've done it a couple different ways i i think it depends on like your level of riding ability for a triathlete on like when you incorporate group rides and when you stop incorporating them and your ability to maintain like intensity on a bike and still the other two sports <clears throat> so for a long time i would only do group rides in off season and then once season came around it'd be me by myself outside of my tt bike hitting whatever watts i need to just this year, leaning into Ironman Texas, I kept group rides in up until like two weeks before Texas. Um, and the group ride we have out in uh, Phoenix, I ride TSR. It's a really high level group ride. I'm like eyes bleeding, trying to like hang on to wheels when like the group takes off. Um, and I'm much better at it in January. I'm pretty bad at it. before an Ironman. Like I'm like, I can't even hang on the front group. I'm like, sorry guys, I'll see you in like 20 minutes. <laughs> that Cause you're tired. Cause they're more in season. I, I don't have a pop. Right. So that when I do long distance, I lose the yeah. pop. When I do off season, I'll get my pop back. And then if there's a surge, I, I can follow. I, I can't follow with Ironman legs. Like I just don't, I don't have it. But if, if like the surge is long enough, I'll probably catch up. Like eventually I'll, eventually I'll get to them. <laughs> you know yeah yeah so what's yeah, the payoff so, like how does that translate to results in triathlon yeah so for me i have been able to raise my threshold like pretty quickly doing group rides because for me so let's say like we go off and the group takes off for 30 minutes on that like threshold just hanging on i have no data on my road bike purposely so i don't even know what my heart rate is it doesn't matter i'm just like hanging on to the wheel right but, that yeah. is so much easier to do in a group than for me to go on my tt bike and try to hold threshold for 30 minutes like it's, yeah. it's so hard to do so in a group you know and then all of a sudden like you recover but another dynamic happens so you're constantly moving through your different zones and being able to maintain that threshold has bumped up my ability to maintain like a race effort on an ironman course so it's been like a huge difference on like how easy Ironman Watts feel now 
after doing group riding all the way through to April, because, you know, when you're at fresh, when you're doing a group ride for four hours and two and a half hours, that's like your threshold, um, you know, that has a significant fitness boost. Um, and I was able to stay healthy and still run the next day. That's the key. Like a year ago, I wouldn't be able to then do my run. I'd be so smashed. But I'm fit enough now where I can a, a run fit enough. Like my, my fitness right. is good enough where I could do that and then go run 20 miles the next day and hit my paces. And that's the key with triathlon. Like you can smash yourself all you want to in a group ride, but if you can't run the next day, what's the point? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Very fine line. So I, Hey, do you coach athletes or do you just, do. This, just spread this <laughs> mindset? <laughs> just you just know, around. Like, I know you <laughs> so you actually coach. Tri uh, triathletes. So I co I do two types of coaching. I do like programming, like I will program you from zero to your first race to the world championships to whatever. I have people are racing X tries, extreme tries that I do, like all, you name it, first five Ks. So I do that, and then I also do this mindset piece. So you can add that to your program if you want to do mindset around your racing okay. or programming um, or training. And then I do just mindset by itself. And so I coach people on literally anything in their life. That they need help fixing, I think is the wrong word, evolving their mindset for. <laughs> yeah. So did you study for that? Or is it yes. are these just off the bike lessons or like how did No, you I studied, I studied for both. Um, you know, like I have um, you know, licensed coach, you know, for mm -hmm. the programming. And then my coach, Marilyn Jacoda, has been my like mentor coach as far as programming, which has been hugely new coaches. It's so great to have somebody to like bounce ideas off of. It's sure. really great. Um, and then I was trained in this specific um, ideology called thought work, which is the mindset work that I use. Um, okay. And the brass packs is you have something happens in your life. It's just a neutral circumstance. You have a thought about it. That thought creates a feeling. And that's where you take your actions from. So it always kind of goes back to if you look at the results you have, like, okay, here's the results of my life. What actions do I take to get me there? And then what's the thought that's causing that? And then it, it always kind of goes back to like, what can you do differently in your mind? And that will then change whatever's happening in your life, more or less. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you find people stick with that for a long time? Do they have a three-month program and like in and out and graduated or is it? I mean, thought work kind of like training as an athlete, a lifelong pursuit. I mean, you're never going to like all of a sudden have like a perfect mindset that like works all it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's always, things are always happening to us. We're always having different thoughts. We're always wanting to evolve and be something better or different or however it is. So you always kind of need help figuring those things out. And I, I have my own coach too, because it's hard to see what's happening in our head sometimes because it feels sure. true. You're like, this is definitely true about myself. Like, I really believe this. And I need somebody else to kind of be like, yeah, but really? <laughs> yeah, it's so <laughs> helpful. They're like, what about that? And you're like, oh, hmm, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. That, so that, I do a lot that, of questions. Yeah, that's good coaching. That's that's awesome. All right. I, just a little bit more coaching. So I've, I've often wondered this, like, how many people can you coach effectively? And yeah. do you just coach one-on-one -on -one or do you do group coaching as well? So I do one-on-one -on -one for everything. So I do one-on-one, -on -one, you know, athletes where I do their programming and, you know, we chat. And then for my uh, mindset coaching, it's a 45 minute session, uh, usually weekly is what people like to do. Sometimes they spread them out differently. Okay. Um, so I do have like a finite amount of time that right. I can, right? So I have so many clients. So right now I I stick with one-on-one. -on -one. Eventually I'll probably have to have a group coaching offers just so I can yeah. coach more people without, and still be able to sleep, <laughs> you know? <laughs> still be able to sleep, still do family things, still get on yeah. your bike and run and, and swim into it. It's, it's like, you're a busy girl. I'm impressed. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't sit still very often. So. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, it's, it's awesome. Um, okay, so you also do these training camps. And where are they located? They're in Costa Rica, just outside okay. San Jose. So you fly into the main airport there. And we're just like a 15 minute drive away from that. Did you have some sort of connection with Costa Rica to start with? Or how'd you find that? I didn't personally. My business partner, Dan, um, he he's actually, his mom's Ecuadorian. So he grew up in, well, all over Central and South America. Um, and then he was living in Costa Rica for 10 years, had just moved to Phoenix and was running the swim school that my daughter was, was swimming at. And I had like an Ironman backpack. He was a former triathlete. We started chatting. And as you do, you're like, oh, you ride a bike? 
great. We should ride bikes together. That's right. That's what you do, right? And of all of a sudden you like, you ride a bike for six hours with a stranger. Like that's perfectly normal. Yeah. So we became friends and we became, we rode together. And he always had a dream of taking people and showing them. And Costa Rica is a phenomenal place to ride a bike. But most people don't think of it. They think of like going to Europe. But yeah. the rides in Costa Rica are rival any of the best rides in Europe. I mean, they are sensational. Um, and so he brought me down for 10 days to ride to be like, A, is it possible for like a competitive age group triathlete to actually do these rides for 10 days? And is it like a business? Um, and so I did it. I was smashed after 10 days. Like, it's like first, first edit can't be 10 days. How about five? <laughs> like 10 is ridiculous. Um, and I was the only woman. And so like, you know, happens the guys take off and you're like, okay, I guess we're going to go fast today. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is, and it's such a beautiful place and we ride with local cyclists down there. So we'll uh -huh. bring, uh, we Europeans and Americans down, and then we ride with 20 to 30 local cyclists who are phenomenal cyclists. So we have this like really big group, a very safe group. They're very, very skilled riders. We have pros down to weekend warriors that we ride with. Um, and so we're always, and what's great is then you share these stories with people from Costa Rica. So you get to know the people and the culture, you get to see places nobody ever sees, no gringo ever sees what we see uh, and the roads that we go on and the volcanoes that we see. And it's, it's a really, it's five magical days of really hard riding. So it's a road, it's a road event. It's road. And road how event. are the roads there? Like in my mind, I'm like, oh, okay. It sounds like a gravel ride, but how are no, the roads in Costa Rica? They're they're fantastic. I mean, I'm used to riding Arizona, and the roads in Costa Rica are significantly better than Arizona. Um, there's a couple like very very steep descents that get like a little like you know not great quality, but by that time you're going like four miles an hour, so <laughs> you yeah. know like it doesn't, doesn't matter. But the rest of it, it's not a lot of debris because it rains. Like we rarely have flats. Um, it's a really safe. I find the roads very safe to ride. Okay. I mean, this isn't an infomercial for your training camp, but I got I know, but it's do really you, good. How's do you need to know Spanish? Is, no, does, I, I still don't know Spanish and I like co own the company. <laughs> okay. It's not a good thing. No, uh, you don't need to know Spanish. Um, and the, the Ticos, the name of the local people are called Ticos. Um, a lot of them speak English pretty well, or they like understand English pretty well and you can get by pretty easily. Get by. And yeah, yes, and the food's amazing. The food's amazing. We have it all catered. Um, we have a local chef come in and cater everything. We stay at this really great, a has little casitas. We stay in this uh, really amazing little spot. Yeah. Okay. So you do CrossFit. No, no, no. I've lost. No, 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 no. I know. I'm just, like, I'm just going backwards. <laughs> so you do CrossFit, you get thrown into a triathlon, you decide you like it. Now you build a business around that. Are you completely checked out of corporate America or whatever you were doing before? Yes. Before I, I ran a nonprofit. So I used to run a nonprofit on uh, global, um, global issues in education, worked in schools. I actually left that when I had my daughter to spend some time with her. And so yeah. I was kind of in this weird, like when I started triathlon, she was two. And so it was this weird, like, what is, what do I do now? I'm, I'm now I'm a mom. I'm not sleeping, but I don't have, it, it, I was in a very odd place where many mothers find themselves at that kind yeah. of like interesting age and triathlon filled a lot of pieces for me and then I just fell in love and so if you love something in my mind you make a business around it and just do it all the time so sure. that's what I've done yeah oh well, you're making it look easy it's not easy for yeah. everybody. I think a lot of people <laughs> want to know like how do I turn my passion into into a life right into not yeah. to it, in a, it's a lifestyle business in a sense but it's also got to be a profitable business because now you've got people to support and, and yeah. it's important. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's super cool. Would you ever go back? Would you ever go oh, back? Oh God, the... no, 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 no. Okay. I mean, I laugh, I laugh. I literally, my whole life is like a tax write-off. <laughs> Everything right. I do is, you know, wrapped up into it. And there's not like, there's, there's, sacrifice I don't have especially as you build a business as any business is it's it's a risky place to be it can be uncomfortable it can be scary sometimes like all those things happen too and so you have to decide is it worth it or is it not and are you going to push through or are you not and so I just right. have accepted the risk and continue to push through to see where it goes and some people don't want to do that you know and that's fine too yeah I think the sooner you can you come to the realization that there is no safety net yeah no matter so what path you go down 
then you can choose whatever path you want. Yeah. Right. I always, I always say to my clients, you know, if you're stuck in decision, like what if like, no matter what you knew and either way this goes, like the best possible scenario is going to happen, like either direction, what then feels like, what's the most fun to do. And like, that should be your decision, you know, because oh. you don't know what's going to happen either way. It could fail, it could succeed. You have no idea. But if you're doing it because it speaks to you or it fills you up or it's fun or whatever you want to use, that's your decision. Cause that's yeah. what, like, that's what will drive you. Yeah. I, I think there are, you know, it's interesting. I've often thought that the best athletes probably are just banging away on a keyboard somewhere and they have no clue and you're proving yeah. my theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm going to take a step further and say, I think maybe some of the most interesting businesses or services or products are just on the shelf somewhere yeah. because people aren't taking the step to bring it forth. And I think it's cool that you're doing it. Like, it's really cool. Um, you. you mentioned that you're often the only woman on a ride. And so talk about that from your perspective, because I think for the guys, right, they're like, okay, the girl's here. And <laughs> for me, the the girls that show up on our rides, like, like, uh, dang it, I really want to keep up with them. Yeah. And so, but give us our, give us a perspective, because most of my listeners are guys, it's a guy dominated yeah. sport. Tell us what it feels like to be a woman being competitive, like, just you know are there struggles are you always a hero like tell us tell us about that yeah there's this weird and it totally depends on like the, it's always hard going to new group because you're like uh oh <laughs> like, sure. for anybody but you're always trying to figure out what the dynamics are and the tsr right i go on the women that come are like wow are they strong right like that's like the level of like, the capacity yeah. um but i've definitely been on group rides i mean a lot of times my, my, i did this um maholan challenge it's this great ride in malibu and it's like oh, yeah. yeah it's like 100 miles and 12, I don't know, some crazy 12,000 feet of climbing. And we're getting to the steep part. And I ride bikes in Costa Rica. Most of our grades are 15 up to 25%. Like I know how to ride a bike up a mountain. And this yeah. guy comes over and he's describing to me like how I should climb, how I should use my bike up the mountain. And I was like, oh, I really appreciate your advice. And just like, you know, took off and did my thing. But it's a lot of assumptions. Like the assumption is a lot of, there's a lot of assumptions about either my ability to ride because I'm a woman, my understanding of bikes because I'm a woman my experience because I'm a woman like that happens a lot and you don't want to stereotype but like usually it takes me riding really really hard that first group ride to like establish myself and I don't know talking about gears like something stupid I'm like oh okay all right she's then she's fine and they're like that's oh awesome. god that's exhausting <laughs> right <laughs> so I really talk like group sets with you fine I'll talk groups like, it's that kind of stuff but like and partly, who I am. Me, you know <laughs> And yeah. part of that's me too, because I want to like show that like I know what I'm doing and like you know that too. So some of that's on me, but typically that's like the dynamic that happens. It's you know it's um I I asked that question because it, like as you said, anytime you show up to a new group ride, you're yeah. immediately it's like you're in the zoo, right? Okay. It looks like it has a good pedal stroke, Yeah. but we don't wear those colors over here and our sock length isn't like that. And you're wearing gloves and we don't wear like, there's all these little culture things for every group ride. Yeah. And so, it, you know, I think everybody feels that, but I, I did wonder you know, what it would be like from your perspective. Um, and you can hear it too. Like I did the old man shootout in Tucson, which is like a really hard, a very hard group ride, very competitive. And I could hear the guys like, oh yeah, she can hang on to a wheel. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's safe to be behind her. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you're <laughs> just like- Plus one, you're the only you. girl and guys <laughs> like girls and girls like guys and all that stuff. And there's gotta be that whole- dynamic too that's awesome um yeah I, I always appreciate the girls that will come out and just and just do it, especially the ones that are just so gifted and just well really... and I immediately make friends with them I ran like hey what's your name we're both women <laughs> let's be friends <laughs> right well I'm sure right that's like the group ride too you're right <laughs> that's uh yeah that's awesome yeah what's your name? yeah um, we're friends <laughs> yeah instant friends you have that instant bond that's awesome um okay so what um 
what is uh yeah what what is a secret or what do you think people miss in preparing for race day oh well i think it's their mindset i mean i think okay. that that is i think I think, I think a lot of what happens is people visualize the best possible day they could ever have. And they visualize that so much that when inevitably something happens in a race that like doesn't fit that, it's like, oh no, this is supposed to happen. Like something's gone wrong. And then, then the race is shot or they, um, they get so anxious or they get so like activated. They can't think clearly and make probably like much simpler solutions. They're making things more complicated and that throws them off too. So I think people prepare really well for the best conditions and really poorly for the worst. And inevitably you're going to get something that's not going to be awesome. And then they just, they don't know what to do. And is there a magic bullet for that? Yeah. You, you, ex you expect all the scenarios. Like if you're stepping on race day, you are, ex you are there for a journey and that journey has a lot of different lessons and you don't know what that day is. And so the understanding that you don't know what the day is ahead of you you have no idea what's going to happen and being totally okay with that and take it as it comes. Like that's the, that's the idea versus like, this is the race I'm going after this race. This is, I mean, like if you approach it that way, like, Ooh, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> and that's where like people, like I triathletes freak out about water temperature, that's the water as if like that'll make or break their day. It's not going to make, made or break your day. Like it's just an obsessive thing or the, the, you know, like the, the weather, you can control the weather. Like, so everybody expects it to be like 70 degrees and overcast, or even if they see 90, like, ah, oh, that'll feel like 70. I'll be all right. I don't need that extra salt. I'm going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the water thing is an interesting component of triathlon, the water temperature thing, because I know at certain events, you can't wear your wetsuit. Right. Because the water's too warm. And I've done a, a and I'm in a handful, like, like that many triathlons and I, I rented it for well, the first one I did in just my surfing wetsuit. So that wasn't the best idea. The yep. next one we did was no wetsuit. It was mm -hmm. Scott Tenley's dirty triathlon. And we get there, it's like 40 degrees and there's steam coming off the lake, but the lake is still like 50 degrees. And it's just the four of us with in our bathing suits. So then I rented a wetsuit from uh -huh. the local tri shop and I swam out and I was like just treading water just kind of warming up and then I stopped treading water and I realized I was floating like a cork and I think if you've never done a triathlon and never want, worn one of those suits like you don't understand the game changing yeah. benefit of those because they automatically float you and they automatically lift your feet up which most people don't do and yep. you swim great so what's it like when you do all that training and then, oh boy, it's too warm. Wetsuits aren't going to be allowed. Like, is that a, is that tough for you? Is it tough in general? Like, how do people handle that? It's not tough for me. It's still a swim. A swim is still a swim. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, right? Like, you got to, some of the things in races, like, you got to let it go. Like, yeah. you know, you drop your water ball. All right, get one of the next aid station. Like, it's, it's those things that I think people get kind of derailed with that kind of build up and can ruin a race day. Yeah. yeah, it's just a swim, you know, and if, you know, Norseman, like, yes, Norseman is cold and I'll do some cold water stuff and I'll be, I will prepare myself for it, but I'm still going to go swim 2.4 miles, no matter what the temperature is that day. Right. And I you guess you're swimming in a pool anyways, without the wetsuit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and in an ocean, you get the natural buoyancy. So like in Kona, for example, no wetsuits, but like you're already buoyant, you know, because of the salt yeah. water. And frankly, the wetsuits are the longer distances make your shoulder, your arms quite tired at the end. And so mm -hmm. like there's benefits and minuses, you know, to the two. So you can make the case that and if it's too hot to have a wetsuit on, you don't actually want to have it on because it will. Just... I'm guessing. Do you have a quiver of wetsuits as well? I have just I have two. Yeah. Do you have a shoulder list for the warmer, warmer I, days I, or longer distances? I, I, I do think? not because a full is always faster. A full wetsuit is always faster no matter what. And so no like what. you never see a pro wearing a sleeveless wetsuit. Okay. So I just, I have, I have one that I'll like train in and one that I'll race in. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. All righty. Okay. So I have my little notes here. We covered, <laughs> um, oh, this is a question I have for you. Do you see a day when you think, okay, I'm just going to specialize on the bike or I'm just going to dedicate a season to running. Do you, do you ever see a future like that? I mean, maybe it'd be hard to get me off of a bike. 
Um, I think that would be really a challenge or out of the water. I can see, like, I, I do really love trail running. That's one of my favorite things. So I can see doing a more emphasis on maybe like a 50 mile trail run on a hundred miles, a, a absurd amount of time to run, but like maybe like a 50 or some, some type of that. And definitely like, eventually I'll probably just be racing my bike. I mean, eventually when my joints get old and you know, my knees hurt or whatever, then I'll just ride my bike for ever. <laughs> That's the plan. But I, be... my, my love is bike riding. What would, yeah. would you race? Would you, have you ever done a bike race? I have, I don't love them. I've done a stage race. I did the, the VOS. Um, oh, ballet stage song. race. Yeah. And the road, well, the, the road, the road races, I don't love the tactic. Like I, I just want to go ride my bike as fast as I can. <laughs> and I don't want right. to deal with the people and the, the I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And then the crit is, I'm not, mm, I'm not a fan of crits. <laughs> they, I, I just like, like you can you can have the line. That's fine. I'll just stay back here. I don't, I don't, care, I don't care that much. So I'm not like a true like road cyclist. Like that's not my vibe. That's not my energy around it. But how did you do on the try on the TT portion of the stage race? Well, I was a cat five, and they didn't let us use TT bikes, <laughs> which makes it really frustrating to be a triathlete on a road bike. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but still you're used to the effort right did you did you still put down a pretty good time well you know i'm not used to it like i don't do a lot of short distance tts like if it was oh, a okay. 56 mile tt i would have picked everybody's ass oh, with a short distance short. what what is it like I, oh, I think so i did the picacho peach it was a 20k tt in january and that on a tt bike and that was a lot more fun actually that was enjoyable okay. Cause I like to be, I'm actually quite aero. Like I ride a TT bike really well. I, I work a lot of my positioning to make sure I'm like as aero as I can be. Mm -hmm. I have fun doing that. Okay. Um, where do you do that? Do you, do you have a wind tunnel or how do you, how do you work on that? The, the, the roads, you know, I have a couple of like specific roads in Arizona where it's a wider shoulder, not a lot of traffic. And then I'll just, you know, work on getting super tucked in, but I ride in my TT bar ton out in Arizona. Um, yeah. Have you worked with a bike fitter on your position? Yeah. Oh yeah, a lot. I usually see him every six months or so. I'll go in and tweak some stuff. And as I really love my P3 rim brake bike and I'm going to ride that thing until mm. it cracks in half. <laughs> yeah. So I've added like aero brakes. Like I've done a lot of like things to it because it's a really fast frame and I really don't want this brakes for a lot of reasons on a TT bike. Yeah. Um, so I've like upgraded that and have worked a lot on the position to make it as fast as it can be so I can compete with the other like newer bikes. I think people, I, I'm glad that you said you go see your bike fitter every six months because I think people forget. Well, one, it's so hard for me to convince people to go get a bike fit. And then they go get it and they're like, oh my gosh, the most amazing thing. I'm riding so much better and my hands don't hurt, <laughs> back doesn't hurt. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. And then they never go back and they don't, you, you don't realize your body's changing as you age, your saddle's wearing out. There's yes. all these things that are changing and you go see, I don't know how your fitters, but I'll go see my fitter probably about the same amount. And they'll just do like one little thing yeah. that I wasn't even thinking about. And I'm like, oh, bro, that was, <laughs> that was that. just what I needed. And I didn't even know I needed it. Um, yeah. It's, and especially in triathlon, because so much of it is like flexibility. So when I first started, I was at, I'm oh, way right. more flexible now. So I can get in a really pretty severe error position comfortably where I couldn't have done that two years ago. But I wouldn't know that unless I slowly adjusted my positioning to get more arrow, more arrow, more arrow. So you just have to, you have to learn how to do that too. And also I, I take apart my bikes and put them together many times during the year to travel with them. And inevitably right. like, I'm like a little, I'm a little millimeter off every time. And by end of the season, I'm like worlds away from where that's my fair. fit should be. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. For sure. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You guys travel a lot because we do travel a lot. There are yeah. a lot of it's like, if you're going to the big races, you, you got to travel. Yes. I think that's, yeah. uh, that's awesome. All righty. Well, is there anything else you would like to cover? What do you want oh, to share? <laughs> what, what, what do we not share that what, when I, when I reached out to you, you thought, yeah, I'd really like to be on that podcast with Todd because I want the world to know. Is there anything <laughs> <laughs> is there anything we haven't covered i mean i think we probably covered i think the most important part of it is you know you need to train your mind just as you train your body and it's not like the day before race day that you figure that out but it's weeks and months before and it's a practice it's just a practice of 
every time you train, anytime you're in discomfort, like what do you do when you're uncomfortable on a bike? Where does your mind go? Where can it go different? Like that makes such a difference in your race day, but then how you deal with other parts of life when you're also uncomfortable, like those things. I mean, I think sports a reflection of life in like a really beautiful way. And we're so like, you know, it's amazing to be athletes and be able to have these experiences. And then we'll be able to apply that to the rest of our life is like the, the greatest gift, I think. And I think a lot of people like don't really make that connection and they, they don't see the beauty of it. And so like, I think that that is mm-hmm. the, the number one gift. It's like, there's a real gift in being an athlete and what you do with it is your choice. So like, you know, use it, train it, train your mind, train your body and do amazing things. So if people want to see your amazing reels on Instagram, where do they yeah. go? Uh, my name, Jennifer Volman is my Instagram handle. Spell I'm, not, I'm, I'm not very creative. <laughs> it's just Spell Volman for them. <laughs> Uh, Volman is V like Victor, O-L-L-M-A-N-N, yeah. two N's because it's German. Yeah. So. so that's, that's where you can find the videos. Are there books you recommend if people want to die? Have you written a book? Do you have anything coming out? I have not written a book. Um, nope. That's a great idea. Not written a book. Um, let's see. Good book. That's a great question. Um, and I'm totally drawing blanks. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I really like uh, my dear friends um, put out a great podcast, Yogi Trathley podcast. So I listen to some of their stuff and their reels and they do like kind of meditation as like it relates to like sports okay. and stuff. And I do a lot of meditation as well. So I get like that kind of, you know, piece of it there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Endure is a good book. I've read that. That's pretty good. I think Endure. There's... Okay. Yeah. Who wrote that? Ultra... Oh, okay. I don't know who wrote that. Clearly I'm, I just swam. Everything goes on my brain when, after I swim. Uh, I feel like I've read that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Born to, born to run all those great things. Oh Anything. yeah. That book's amazing. It's amazing. Right. Just, I just love the like real endurance. I, yeah. yeah. I, and his other my, book, uh, natural born athletes. Yes. The, that, that, yeah. The, both those books are really, really good. Um, yeah. all right. So you're, I uh, will, we'll end this as we started. You're in Greer. Yes. Because All the cyclists should come here because it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and you're at 8,500 feet. Yes. And is that for adaptations for upcoming races or just because it's a lot cooler than the Tucson Valley right now? I mean, it's it's a lot cooler. It's beautiful up here. Um, and also it does, it is great for adaptations. Like it's it's not a bad place to be. So I'll be up here more or less until August when I race in Norway. And I've done this a couple of times where I spend a lot of time up here in the summer and I race off of it. And I, I do really well racing okay. off of adaptations from altitude. So probably like a little high, <laughs> but I can't, I can't bring the mountain down any. So right. <laughs> what I got. <laughs> well, it looks awesome. You're awesome. I really appreciate your time. And, uh, well, I wish you the best of luck if I don't Thank talk you. to you before then, and I'm sure you're going to post about it and I will. Share about it. about it. It's going to be nuts. All right. Well, okay. I just got to ask you one last question. On that boat. Yeah. How many people are jumping off that boat? So the registered athlete list, they just released this 318, but typically not like not everybody actually makes it to the race for whatever okay. reason. So, so I think they're same. Yeah. Like, so I think they usually, I think it's probably like 260 is like the average like number of participants that actually start the race. And then, uh, endorsement is different if you have to be the first 150 participant and there's no uh there's no pro race it's just you're the man or woman like that's how you race and yeah. then uh but it's 150 160 you get to go and do the extra hard course to get a black shirt and if you don't make that then you do the less hard course to get a white shirt so like everybody wants a black shirt is like the is big distinction between wait when do they races. when do they determine if you're in the top 160 there's a cutoff point you have to reach a certain checkpoint on the run to determine if you can continue to do the black horse or if you have to go oh into the that's race. cool yeah and it's you know as and it, there's and there's no gender differences and there's no pro difference it's just the first 160 people that this are there is what it is so actually for the first time ever i'm racing men to be the first 160 so i get to race which is kind of fun now i get to race everybody <laughs> right no it's cool so are you a black shirt or are you a white shirt I sure hope I'm going for the black shirt. So, you I know, I don't know. How, I don't know how good the 159 people are <laughs> that I have to beat, but I'm sure that I can, you know, I'll, I'll right. figure it out. You tap yeah. into your inner New Zealand rugby player, the black shirts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> you have to be a warrior out there. 
All right. You're awesome. Best of luck. And we'll uh, so I'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure. Awesome. Thank you. All right. You bet. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. These podcasts and vlogs are new for pedal industries. So if you're enjoying them, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks so much. Keep challenging yourself.